We are now looking at Romans chapter 15, uh, the second to the last chapter, and we'll be reading from verses 14 all the way through to verse 33, the end of the passage. Romans chapter 15, beginning from verse 14. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you, are your, you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the, of the grace given me by God to be a minister to Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have, I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to, to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem, for they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness, fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by Christ, God's will, I will come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Thank you, Calvin. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you as we are almost done with this uh, sermon series in the book of Romans. As Calvin mentioned, uh, we're really winding down now. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just one last sermon after this one in chapter 16, which is very exciting if you've ever read Romans 16. It's a lot of names, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll look at that next week. And so for uh, this week, um, you know, as since it's the second to last sermon, I thought that it would be good for us to, you know, I haven't shown this slide in a while, as so I thought it would be good for us to actually just you know, for the next two weeks, just briefly review, you know, in the, in the beginning of the sermon, uh, just what we've been talking about throughout this entire book of Romans, which you started, uh, I think, back in June of last year. And so uh, this is the, this is the, uh, the uh, outline that we've been working with as we've been going through the book of Romans. And, <clears throat> and if you remember, right, Paul starts off with some greetings, some introduction, and then he jumps right in, in Romans chapter 1, about the wrath of God. Right, he first tells us about what is our human condition before the Lord. And basically, the main point here uh, is none are righteous. Right? The main point here is no one is righteous, not Gentile, not Jew. Nobody on earth is righteous uh, due to our good works. Right? And so that's the way that he starts off. So that the wrath of God is rightly poured out upon mankind as we have rebelled against God and don't want to follow him. Right? And then <clears throat> the biggest chunk in this chapter from 3 to 8 you know, is all about the grace of God. Right? So in light of our 
condition before the Lord, Paul then explains to us the grace of God. And he works in a lot of different ways throughout 3 through 8 to explain to us that we are saved by faith, by faith in Christ through grace. Right? And really the big idea there is like how, how do we think about our salvation? Right? How are we saved? And Paul makes it super clear. Right? We are saved by faith, not by works, right? by faith in Christ through the grace of God. <clears throat> And so, you know, that's, you know, in some ways the main reason why I wanted to preach through Romans is for 3 through 8, you know, to really help us understand where is our, how do we have good standing before the Lord, right? Is it by our works? No, it's not by our works, but simply through faith in Christ, right? By the grace of God. Now, you know, even when I was about to do Romans, I was really scared of 9 through 11, um, but we got through it okay, I think. And so, you know, 9 through 11 talks about the the plan of God. And if you remember, it's plan of God for Israel. But through 9 11, we see Israel mentioned in two different ways, right? He talks about both the physical descendants of Israel, the ethnic Israel, but then he also talks about how we are all part of the spiritual Israel, right? So plan of God to save Israel, and then finally, uh, in the past couple of weeks here, we've been talking about the will of God. But basically, how does God want us to live out our lives? And I really think the main, I think, I think the biggest idea here, you know, is in Romans twelve nine, right, which says, "Let your love be genuine." I, mean, I think that kind of encapsulates everything, right? Everything else that he says uh, after in Romans twelve is all about this. If you just let your love be genuine for one another. Right, let your love be genuine. And he focuses, you know, past two weeks we've been talking, three weeks we've been talking a lot about unity. Right, if you really let your love be genuine for one another, there will be unity in the midst of the church, despite all the differences that we have. <coughs> now, I really want to emphasize that this all really builds into this whole theme, right, of the righteousness of God in you. Right, the righteousness of God in you. And this is what the book of Romans is all about. Right? First of all, it's about the righteousness of God. Right? We see that in the first three chapters. Right? God, God's wrath right, is poured out in holiness. Right? God is righteous. And you see the righteousness of God. Right? And, and it's about how we are sinful, but how God is holy and just. But I would fail to communicate the gospel if Romans was just about the righteousness of God. Right? And those last two words is the gospel, is the righteousness of God in you. Right, how does the righteousness of God get into each one of us? Right, that is the gospel, that by faith in Christ, through grace, right, we are righteous. We have good standing before God right, because of what Christ has done for us. Right, but in that last section, right, in the will of God section, the righteousness of God is in us now. Right, we have good standing before God. And I think what God, Paul then, and God calls us to do right, is to live out our, that, that righteousness that is in us is going to come out. Right? If we've truly been made righteous, if, we, if our heart has been transformed, that righteousness that is in, in us is going to start flowing out. Right? And that's how we, you know, Paul says, we, let's work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Right? That righteousness of God is then lived out into our lives right, through good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. All right, so basically this is, you know, the, the outline of Romans um, and the theme of Romans. Um, and, you know, I, as many people have said before me, right, the greatest book in many ways in the Bible, right, Romans just lays out everything, uh, so much for us in the Christian life. Now, <clears throat> so we're in the last section, closing remarks. You know, this is a part where maybe you'll just skip or skim or, you know, what's, what's so, you know, why, why are we going to spend time talking about these closing remarks? But uh, even in this last few sections, I think there's a lot that we can, you know, learn and a lot that we can, uh, you know, that, that God has to show us through these, you know, you know, even though it's just closing remarks, right? So as Paul, you know, talks about his own ministries, he's also going to talk about his travel plans, which we'll talk about a little bit today. And I feel like this is actually the I think the second time in like two years I'm talking about travel plans up here, you know, because I think when we go through the book of 1 Corinthians, right, Paul's also talking about his travel plans. But then we're going to see today, like even Paul's travel plans actually can show us, you know, a little bit something about uh, God's workings in Paul's life. So, you know, all scripture is God-breathed, right? All scripture is useful and for helpful for us for instruction so that we can be prepared for every good work. So let's come into God's word uh, with uh, expectant hearts. Right, for what God's going to show us. So we jump in, right? So starting in verse 14, uh, Paul says this. It says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. 
Now, as I think about this, right, I think there's a couple things that stand out to me about this verse, right? What stands out to me here is that, you know, Paul is addressing the entire Roman church, right? It's, it's expected that this letter would be uh, read in front of the entire congregation, right? And be really exciting, right? It's, hey, we got a letter from Paul, you know, and whoever's up front will take it out and they'll read it, you know, to everyone. And so when you get to this point, you know, that must have been a, I don't know, would that have been a short service or a long service to read through all of Romans? You know, I don't know. I don't know how long that would take. But actually, I'd probably wouldn't take that long. But, you know, so he would come up and read the entire book of Romans, right, the letter that Paul wrote. And when you get to this point where he says, I myself am satisfied of you, my brothers, that you are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Right, I really think that Paul is talking here to the entire church, right, all of you, right? And, and I can say this right now about all of you. You are full of goodness, ab- uh, filled with knowledge, and able to instruct one another. And I think what that means is that, uh, you know, it's not, I think it's not just the job of the pastor, or it's not just the job of those in full-time ministry to be in ministry, to do some kind of ministry, right? I think what Paul is saying is that, hey, listen, each one of you, right, you are filled with knowledge, each one of you are full of goodness, and each one of you are able to instruct one another. Therefore, each one of us, as we're sitting here in this room, have a ministry, Right? If you are a Christian, if you're a disciple of Christ, you have a ministry. You are called right, to use the gifts and, and the time and the resources that God has given you in order to serve and build up one another. I think, as, as many people have noted, you know, one of the problems with having uh, professional pastors is that, you know, I think two things, right? Either members of the church feel like they're not qualified to do ministry. You know, maybe you're like, I've never been to seminary, right? So like, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. I'm not a professional at this, right? And one of the problems, right, is that people don't feel like they're actually qualified to serve in various capacities inside the church, right? And so they say, oh, no, I can't do that, I'm not trained. And I think that's one of the issues, you know, with having professional uh, pastors being professional, right? It's like, you know, sometimes you feel like you're not equipped uh, to do so. And I think the other issue is that, you know, maybe say, oh, you know, it's not my job to do that. You know, it's the pastor's job to do that. You know, I just come and listen and try to grow and try to, you know, learn. But, you know, it's the pastor's job to do ministry, right? And, you know, First Peter actually tells us, right? It says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And clearly this is not a promise just for clergy or just for pastors, right? This is a promise for every single one of us, that we are a royal priesthood, a people of his own possession, right? And that we are called to use our gifts, right, to bring him glory for the sake of the body of Christ. (coughs) You know, so I really think all of us here, you know, are really called by God to use our gifts and abilities to serve one another. And, you know, maybe the other problem with having professional pastors is, you know, a lot of times maybe we think that, oh, if I want to do ministry, right, it means that I have to teach or I have to talk in front of people or I have to lead a small group or I have to, you know, be, it has to be like very public in some way. And unfortunately, I think, you know, this has been a critique, I think, of church, you know, a fair critique of church is that, you know, sometimes ministry tends to take the flavor of those who are in leadership, right? So even though, you know, the activities of preaching and teaching are essential to the church, sometimes we get, we just think, oh, that's what ministry is, right? You have to stand up and preach and teach, right? But, but I think what ends up happening is we might end up over, under-emphasizing right, or undervaluing other forms of ministry right, that we can all engage in that are actually necessary right, for this body of Christ to function and for this body of Christ to build one another up. Right? And so I, as I think about you know, our, our congregation, right, I think about those who, you know, so you know, areas where I feel like this is, you know, ministry in the sense that you're building one another up, right? You're encouraging one another, right? So I'm thinking of those who, you know, those in a congregation would share with everyone their gift of baking, you know, like receive, you know, good, you know, having baked goods in second hour or, or being handed to you on, on a Sunday, you know, is a real blessing. Or thinking about those who have, you know, share with us their skills of uh, spreadsheets. You know, I don't know how we would come up with the uh, retreat price if it wasn't for, you know, someone with very skilled in spreadsheets coming out with, <clears throat> you know, something like that. Or, you know, I think of those who have, you know, graphic or artistic abilities in making both our digital and physical space, you know, more inviting and more welcoming. You know, if it was up to me to design a space, right, the room would probably look kind of like a prison or like a college dorm, you know, it would just be four walls and a podium for me to speak at, you know, I don't really think of aesthetics, you know, very much. And so, you know, the idea is that, you know, or I'm thinking of those who maybe like excel at hospitality, 
right? Those who are constantly inviting people, you know, over their homes, right? Or maybe those that excel at caring or providing meals, right? Or reaching out to those that are struggling, right? Or even those that are really good at gathering people. You know, I, me and Amy, as we're looking back at our time here in the church, were great benefits of someone who constantly invited us, invited us out to events. Right? There's just one person that anytime there's anything going on, is hey, Amy Wayne, you want to come out? You know, and that was a huge encouragement you know, to us in, in being a part of our community. <coughs> and so I think my point in all this is that in many ways, all of us have a ministry. Right? And don't just think of ministry as what is done up in the front. Right? All of us have a ministry and are called by God. Right? And, and it's necessary, really, for each one of us to use the gifts that God has given us right, in order to serve the body of Christ. Right? So right now, right, as I'm ministering, you know, so one way to seeing this right, is right now I'm ministering to you. Right? Hopefully I'm being helpful. Hopefully I'm ex- expositing God's word. Hopefully I'm teaching God's word accurately. But then once we dismiss, right, once, I, once I say the benediction and we dismiss, in many ways each one of our ministries starts. Right? All of us start ministering to one another. You know, and really that after-service fellowship time, you know, I think is actually one of the most important times of our life together, right? That's when you meet new people. That's where we schedule times to meet together. That's where we catch up on what's going on in each other's lives, right? And so, you know, <clears throat> but, you know as we're thinking about this, I feel like the question always comes up, right? Like, okay, but I don't know what my gifts are, or I don't know how I can, you know, be a blessing to this body of Christ. And I really think, you know, really the only way to figure that out is to try serving in some capacity, right? You're never gonna know unless you try serving in some capacity. And there are gonna be some things that come more easily to you, right, than to other people. And in many ways, that's like how I define gift. So my my definition of gift is very basic, right? My definition of a gift is basically just something that comes easily to you, right? So like, for example, this always comes up in Kidsmen. You know, one of the most hardest things about Kidsmen is coming up with a craft, you know, so, you know, we, we don't do as many crafts anymore, but to me, when I was teaching Kidsman, like, I would spend, like, a quarter of my time preparing the lesson. He's like, oh, I got this, you know, I can do that. I can teach kids the Bible. And then, like, 75% of my time was scrolling Pinterest and Google Images looking for a craft that I can do with the kids, and it was super stressful. It was really, you know, you know, it was not, like, not, it was not enjoyable, but it was just, like, really stressful. Like, I don't know, I don't know what, what craft do I choose. But then other people are like, dude, that's so easy. You just, just do something. You just, you have a couple pieces of construction paper, you could do something. You know, anyone can do this. And it's like, no, not anyone can do this. This is actually, you know, not easy. And so maybe that's, like, I may even say, like, my definition of what is a gift, right? A gift is something where you say, oh, anyone, that's easy. Oh, anyone can do this. But it's like, no, 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 <laughs> actually not everyone can do this, right? It's something that comes naturally or more easily uh, to you, right? And so, you know, as we're talking about, you know, church, serving in church, um, you know, for, <clears throat> uh, or, yeah, so as, as we talk about serving in our church, right, I think one of the things that we've been talking about on the strategic planning team um, is that, um, and this even came out when we were doing our self-study uh, interviews as well, is that, you know, one of the things that we've noticed in our church when it comes to serving, right, I'm asking you, know, asking you guys to serve or asking you guys to, you know, be in positions where you're serving one another. One of the things that always came up actually was burnout, right? And so one of the things that came up in the self-study was that, you know, it seems like in the past, right, it seems like every time people, you know, were, called, were asked to serve or asked to do something, right, that many times that would lead to uh, lead to burnout, right? And, and one of the things that we noticed is that maybe it's usually because maybe you're not being supported, right, in the role that you're in, or maybe you're not working as a team with other people, right, or maybe you feel like you're just, you know, on your own and you got to figure it out by yourself. Or the other thing is that maybe there's no term limits, right? So you just feel like if you serve in some capacity, it's just like, oh, you just got to do it indefinitely, you know, until maybe someone will take it over, right? And so one of the main things as a strategic planning team that we've been kind of thinking about, you know, is, well, the easiest thing is, first of all, term limits, right? So I've been asking people to say, hey, you know, one year commitment, you know, every single year, I'll ask you again, you know, hey, do you, are you willing, to, what do you think about coming on and serving for another year, right? But, and another thing, you know, we've been talking about is leadership training, you know, as well, right? Being able to train and support leaders. Uh, but I've also been, like, throwing around this idea of maybe even having, like, a trial period, right? So maybe you're like, hey, maybe I'm kind of interested in Flourish or Aspire, but I don't really know what it means to lead. And I'm like, what if, you know, maybe we'll have a trial period. You, know, you can just come on for, you know, maybe up to three months or something and just be like, hey, I'm just here to try it out. You know, no commitment, no strings attached. I'm just going to 
try, th try it out, you know, see if this is something that, you know, works uh, for me. Right, and so I think, you know, um, and really one of the other things that we've been thinking about, you know, and also this is very much in line with this passage, is that, you know, what are our expectations for members? Or what are our expectations for each one of us uh, as, uh, as members, right? Because if you're going to be a member of our church, right, that has to mean something, right? It has to mean, you know, what, are, what is it that you're committing to, right, if you're going to be part of our church body, Right, and, and even our, you know, membership vows, you know, our membership vows also says something along the lines of that you promise to render some kind of service to our community as you have ability, right? And, and being a member, <coughs> and being a member in, in some ways, it's kind of like being uh, in a marriage, although it's a little different because it's not for life, you know, you're not committing, you know, for life necessarily, but it's, it's a marriage in the sense of like, you know, we're committing to one another, Right, we're saying a promise before God that we're going to commit to one another. Right, to be a member here, we're committing to serve one another. Right, we're committing to love one another. We're committing to build one another up in Christ. Right, and committing to, uh, do, uh, and to love one another and to accomplish God's mission together as a church. And so, when, and so in the coming months, you're probably going to hear more about this. Right? But you know, it's like, what are some of the expectations that we have you know, for members? And how do we you know, really commit to one another? Right, and really be the community that God has called us to be, and really what does it look like for our church together right, to live out God's mission in our lives. Because right, in many ways, I think this is what this verse is saying. Right? It's saying that every single one of us, right, you are full of goodness, you are full of knowledge because of your faith in Christ, because the Holy Spirit is in each one of you, right, that each one of us has a ministry. Right? Each one of us has a ways in which we can use our gifts and abilities to serve our body of Christ and to serve God and to serve our community. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> just to, so really quickly before we move on, you know, one of the things that I want to point out here is that um, based on this translation, right, to be able to instruct one another, it makes it seem like this is about uh, teaching. Uh, but actually, the Greek word used here uh, is, of, is often translated to admonish one another. Right? So to admonish one another, it can have like a more negative aspect to it, like almost like a scolding. But I think it's like usually much nicer, usually a little bit a softer tone uh, in terms of admonishing, right? So admonishing uh, can mean to like advise someone, to remind someone, or to give someone an encouragement, right, in their lives. And so I think, you know, even though it seems like this is, you know, talking about teaching, but I think it's more than just teaching, right? This is the ability to uh, be in one another's lives enough to the extent, right, that you can actually speak the truth and love to one another, Right, and so this is something that God has called you know each one of us to do. Right, with the ministry that we, whatever it is uh, that that God has given given to you, resources, gifts, abilities. Right, we're called to use it for the sake of the body and for the sake of God's mission. So, <clears throat> yeah. So this is you know I think the first aspect you know of what Paul is saying to the Romans. Right, that 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 God has given you a gift. Let's use it for one another. But this is you know what Paul says next. So. <clears throat> Paul then writes in verse 15, he says, But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. And so a couple things I think to notice here. I think the first thing it says, Paul says that I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder. Now, I really like that statement because that means that some of the things that Paul writes here in the book of Romans, right, would have been very contentious, right, in the church. Um, and so I think, you know, as you read through, you know, the, the letter, you see that Paul was actually very careful in this letter, right, to uh, actually just do what he says, that just said, right, to admonish one another, where right? he tries to speak the truth in love. And I do appreciate that Paul was also a little bit nervous about how the church would take it, because I feel like, you know, each, every time I'm like, okay, I have to have a conversation with someone, you know, I'm really praying, you know, that, you know, God prepare the other person's heart, hopefully the person will take it well, you know, like, you know, I have to say this to the person, let me, you know, I hope they, you know, respond well, right? And so in some ways, it fills me with, you know, some comfort, I guess, that even Paul, right, was a little bit nervous about this in writing this letter, right? He was a little nervous about how the Romans uh, would take it, right? Ho really hoping that this would lead them to unity and not more division, right? But 
it's interesting that, <clears throat> that it, Paul also says, it's not that the Roman Christians didn't know this already. Right? The Roman Christians knew all this that was in the book of Romans. And so he says, you know, I have written to you by way of reminder. Now, that's, I always find that interesting because, you know, we say that a lot, right? I feel like a lot of times after sermons or a lot of times after Bible studies, we're like, oh, yeah, 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 that was a good reminder. You know, that was a good, uh, you know, so in many ways, like, you know, the Christian life isn't so wide in, in terms of, like, I'm not going to be sharing with you, you know, like, crazy insights that you've never known before every sermon, right? A lot of times it is reminders. Um, uh, and, <clears throat> but the thing about reminders, right, the re- I think even when we say, oh, that was a good reminder, I think sometimes what we mean by that is, yeah, I know that is true, but I've yet to incorporate that thing into my life. Right? When we say, oh, yeah, that was a good reminder, what we're kind of saying is like, oh, yeah, you know, oh, yeah, I know, I know that already, but I haven't actually like really fully brought that into my life. And so really my, my challenge to you, right, as we think about this, is that when you hear something and you say, oh, that was a good reminder, my challenge to you is don't just let that be a good reminder. Right? Because hopefully next time, that you hear it, you can say, oh, yeah, 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 I've already incorporated, you know, a lot of that truth into my life, right? Don't just, don't just let it just be a good reminder, right? But maybe hopefully by the next time you can say, okay, you know, it's not just a reminder because I've actually tried to incorporate that into, you know, our lives, right? Because essentially, you know, Christianity is not super hard to understand, right? Essentially, it's just love God, love people, right? But actually in doing that will require all of our lives and take the rest of our lives, right? And so, you know, I think that's my, you know, uh, challenge to you, right? Let's just not keep saying, oh yeah, that was a good reminder. But let's find ways to actually integrate that into our lives, right? Now, <clears throat> it also stands out to me, the other thing that Paul says here is that he says that he is a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, Right, so it's interesting to me that Paul is very specific about who he is reaching out to. Right, and Paul says this later on in verse 20. He says, And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, where, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. And what's really interesting here is that Paul, you know, he needed to make a about who he was going to minister to. And we actually see this in the book of Acts, right? He's like, okay, so who am I going to, you know, I can go anywhere in the world to preach the gospel. Where am I going to go? You know, I can go here, I can go there, you know. So he had to make a decision about who he was going to minister to. And basically the way, the thing that guided Paul's decision making was to say, hey, these guys have never heard the gospel before, right? So that's where I'm going to go, All right? Those guys have heard the gospel. I'll let someone else do that ministry. My, my goal, my vision, is to preach the gospel to those who have never heard the gospel before. Now, of course, both is needed. Right? We need people who are going to be shepherding established churches, but we also need people who are willing to go right, where the gospel has never been heard before. Right? And, um, <clears throat> and I think part of the application of this passage, right, as we think about this, like, as we think about this idea that Paul was, a, was ministering specifically to the Gentiles, I think that can cause us to ask the question, who does Christ specifically call you to minister to? Who does Paul specifically call you to minister? And in some ways, we come back to this idea of, you know, gifts and calling. I I can't necessarily speak for Paul, but I wouldn't be surprised if Paul would rather be in a comfortable, you know, like a nice preaching place where there's Christians all around and, you know, it's comfortable and there's brothers and sisters in Christ and go to prayer meetings, you know, he can preach without people yelling at him. You know, that seems nice, you know, like the job that I have, you know, that seems nice. And, or, right, he can go to where, you know, where, where Christ has never been preached uh, before. And, then, and God gave him that vision and a calling to preach, right, where Christ has not been known. And so I think, the way that we apply this, I think it's fair to say, right, that we don't have to feel pressure to reach out to everyone. Right? We don't have to feel the pressure that we have to reach out to everyone. But I think God does call us to minister to someone. Right? Then we don't have to reach out to everyone. Right? There's a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of directions that you can go in. And so I don't think we should feel pressure to reach out to everyone. But I do think that God has called us to reach out to someone. Right, in the early church, uh, Peter, James, and John, you know, he, they basically said, hey, listen, we're going to be the pastors of the church in Jerusalem. Right? And, and, <clears throat> and Paul said, okay, cool. You know, you're going to be the p- pastor in the church in Jerusalem. I'm going to go preach to the Gentiles. And <clears throat> you know, in Acts 15, 
you know, it actually says that they had this big meeting of apostles, right? They were all together in Jerusalem, and basically they extended a hand of fellowship to one another. Right? Paul said, hey, you've been called by God to minister in Jerusalem? That's great. That's needed. I've been called by God to preach to the Gentiles, and Peter, James, and John said, that's great, right? We, we, we love your ministry. We pray for your ministry, right? And they extended the hand of fellowship to one another. And, and basically they're saying, acknowledging that both ministries are important, right? Whether you're staying in Jerusalem or whether you go into the ends of the earth, right? Both ministries are of great importance. And so I think that question is, who has God put on your heart to minister to? Right? Maybe there's a group of people, or maybe there's you know, someone whom you are well-equipped uh, to minister to. You know, I think of, you know, or maybe even social groups, right, where you are equipped and well-liked and where you're, where you're well-respected, right? I think of, like, sometimes, you know, you're, you guys are in all in different social groups outside of church, Right? And so if I was to walk into your social group somewhere, right, everyone would look at me and be like, what are you doing here? Like, who are you? Like, I don't trust you. Like, why are you here? But each one of you right, are accepted and well-respected and loved in a social group right, outside of church. And the idea is that, <clears throat> right, that it's kind of like gifts and ability or gifts. Right? It's like, what are the groups, what are the people, what are the connections that God has allowed me to have? Right, and what does it look like for me to minister uh, to them? Right, so you know, I don't think we have to feel pressure. Like, oh, you have to minister to everybody in your life? You know, but I do think that God does call us, right, to minister to somebody that is in our lives. Now, you know, as we go out and minister to people, and we do need to think about, though, you know, like, what is our goal? Right, what is our goal in terms of uh, in ministry? Because sometimes I feel like, you know, I've seen this before, where it's like you minister to someone, you try to get them to come to church, and maybe they do come to church, and either you think, oh, my job is over because they're in church now, you know, or it's like, you know, or sometimes like, you know, they don't come to church, and it's like, you know, yeah, sometimes you lose touch with them or whatever. And so it's like, you know, what is our goal, though? Like, what is our actual goal when it comes to ministering to other people? And, you know, it's interesting because uh, Paul actually tells us, right, what his hope for the Gentiles is, right? What is his goal as he's reaching out to the Gentiles, right? And so he says here in verse 15, he says, or 16, he says, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have a reason to be proud of my work, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. Now, real quick, you know, when Paul says, I'm proud of my work, right, I think there's a difference between pride, right, and being proud of what you have done, right? So I think there's nothing wrong with being proud of the good work that you have done, right? But even in ministry, right, what is Paul proud of, right? He says, nothing except what Christ has been able to accomplish through me. But then he says very specifically, right, to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. And I think what Paul is saying here is that Paul wasn't just looking for, peop- for converts, right? Paul wasn't just looking for people to say, you know, to get people to say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, Right, and what we do here at church, you know, is we're not just hoping for warm bodies to, you know, to fill seats. Right? We're not hoping to just get our attendance numbers up so we can you know, be proud of something. But really, the goal, right, the vision that we have in mind, the vision that Paul had in mind, right, was to bring people to, in obedience, to obedience, in both word and deed. Right? Paul wasn't just looking for, for professions of faith. Right? He was looking to build up those who would be obedient to Christ. Right, when we think of like Roman, when we think of uh, Matthew 28, right, the Great Commission, right, but Jesus doesn't say, you know, go therefore and make converts of all people or make or have professions of faith of all people, right? Paul says, no, 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 but Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, right? In many ways, discipleship is more than just a profession of faith, right? Anyone can say that, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, or anyone, you know, can even come to church, right? But there's a difference between being Saying, saying that you're a Christian versus being a disciple. Right? And being a disciple, I think there's this long, lifelong desire right, to bring our whole lives under the lordship of Christ. And you know, sometimes as a pastor, I worry, <clears throat> I do worry that sometimes uh, many of us would just identify ourselves as a Christian. That like we just identify ourselves like, you know, someone asks, hey, are you a Christian? You'll probably you know, say yes. Right? And in some ways, I worry that we would only identify ourselves as a Christian, but not as a disciple of Christ. Right? Because if I were to ask you, hey, are you a Christian? Like, probably a lot of you would say yes. But if I were to ask you, hey, are you a disciple of Christ? Right? Some of us may hesitate a little bit. 
right? Because being a disciple, as we know, is going to require a bigger commitment. Right? Being a disciple means that we might need to make some changes in our lives. Right now, the thing I want to be clear about is that being a disciple does not mean that there's a certain bar that you have to meet before you can become a disciple. Right? Sometimes I worry about this word discipleship because, you know, that people don't want to declare that they're a disciple of Christ because they don't feel like they've qualified yet. They don't feel like they've done enough to say, oh, yeah, 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 I'm a disciple of Christ. Like, I have to do something, I have to be enough in order for me to declare myself that I'm truly a disciple of Christ. Because that's not actually how it works. Right? That's actually not how discipleship works. Because, you know, if you think about it, remember when Jesus called his disciples. Right? When Jesus called his disciples, you know, what he said to them was he said, hey, Peter, hey, Andrew, right? hey, James, hey, John, come and follow me. Right? And what did they do? They dropped what they were doing and they came and followed him. And if you think about that, right, it's like, were they mature? At that point, no, like not at all. That, were they knowledgeable at all about Christianity? In fact, they were not. In fact, the rest of the gospel shows just how, how you know, they, they just didn't get it. Like the rest of the gospel just shows how they just really didn't understand the message of Christ until he died and rose again, right? And so they, they you know, they weren't mature. They didn't have the great understanding of, of the Christian faith. But were they disciples? Yes, right? When they dropped what they were doing and they said, I'm going to follow you. Right, at that point, they are disciples of Christ. And really what it means to be a disciple right, is to be willing to learn, willing to be teachable, and willing to follow Jesus in everything that he might call us to do. Right, and really, I think this is what Jesus calls us to do at here, church, here at our church. Right? We're not just trying to get people to show up on a Sunday. Right? But our goal is to make disciples. Right? Our goal is not just have you say, you know, I believe in Jesus, but to see our whole lives lived in obedience and love for Christ, right? And so, you know, I always go back to strategic planning team because it's been on my mind a lot, but also this is like super important to the future of our church because, you know, one of the main goals as well of our strategic planning team is to, to figure out what does it look like, right, for our church to engage in discipleship, right? What does our discipleship process look like, right, for every single person in this room, right? What does it look like for our church to say, hey, if you're part of our church, this is how we're going to disciple you. This is how we live out, you know, this is how we're going to make disciples of all nations here at our church. So <clears throat> maybe I'm putting a little too much pressure on the strategic planning team, but, you know, these are really important questions, right, that we have to answer together as a church. And so do pray for us as we, you know, continue in our discussion and, um, and as we pray, right, for, the, for what it looks like for our church to actually do discipleship. <clears throat> now, Last thing, a final thing I just want to share with you this morning um, is just uh, really briefly about Paul's travel plans, because this is kind of how he ends, and um, I also want to show you why this is, this is relevant for us. So, you know, so this is how Paul talks about his travel plans. So he says, this is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. So basically what Paul is saying, I've been hindered... F- from coming to you because there's uh, people that I need to share the gospel with, right? There's people that have never heard Christ, so I have to share the gospel with them. So this is, this is the reason why I have been so hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. <coughs> Right, so Paul is preaching in, you know, in, in Asia Minor, and he's basically saying, hey, most of the region has churches, established churches uh, with elders, and my work is kind of done, right? Where am I going to go to preach the gospel where it hasn't been heard? And so he says, I know where I'm going to go. I'm going to go to Spain. Right, I'm going to go to Spain, the western part of the Roman Empire, because they haven't heard the gospel yet. And so Paul actually didn't plant the church in Rome. Right? Other people planted the church in Rome. And then uh, Paul says, hey, I want to visit you guys before I go out to Spain. And I think many historians are kind of are thinking that what Paul is thinking is like he wants the Roman church to be his home base, right? that he can establish himself in the Roman church, and that's how he's going to reach out to the western part of the empire. Now, it's actually debated among historians whether or not Paul actually made it to Spain. We're actually not 100% sure if Paul actually made it all the way to Spain. Um, but w- what we do know in the Bible, right, as far as we know, like the Bible never gives us any hint that Paul actually got to Spain um, and, and came back. But we do know what we do know in the Bible is that we do have the last letter that he wrote, right? And the last letter that he wrote is the letter of Second Timothy. And, you know, when you read it in 
that context. So in 2 Timothy, it's actually kind of sad. It's kind of actually kind of a sad book when you kind of understand the context, right? Because Paul is sitting in prison, right? He knew that he was about to die. And this is kind of his very last letter to his dear friend Timothy, right? And so he says, you know, to Timothy, hey, continue the work of the gospel, right? He says to Timothy, hey, preach the word, right? He says to Timothy, warn against sin, right? And so it's kind of this sad book when you put it in the context of Paul's very last letter, right? Because also at the very end there, right, Paul says, hey, I have fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith, right? And so in the book of Second, Paul knew that he was about to die, right? And I think what we can learn from here, you know, as I think about this is that, you know, what we can learn from Paul's travels plans is that a man's, a man's heart can plan his course, right? But the Lord is the one who establishes his steps. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, Paul's plans were good, Right? He wanted to do the work of the Lord. He wanted, to, uh, he wanted to go to Spain and preach the gospel. That's a good thing. Right? But Paul's plans did not work out as he thought that they would. Right? Because if you know from the book of Acts, right, Paul actually did make it to Rome. Right? He did eventually make it to Rome. But if you remember, how did he get to Rome? Right? He got to Rome as a prisoner. Right? He got to Rome in chains. Right? So basically he got arrested Right, and then he said, I appeal to Caesar. And when you appeal to Caesar, it means that you are granted an audience in front of Caesar. And so in chains, Paul was brought to Rome. And I really like that verse, you know, because it's like, yes, we should make plans. Right? Paul had a plan, right? In this book, in Romans, he had a plan of what he was gonna do. But and, and we as likewise, right, we need to think about what we want to do in the future. But we always remember, right, is that the Lord is the one who establishes our steps. And just like Paul, our plans are not always going to work out the way that we want them to. Right? Just, like, just like Paul, right, he was not planning on getting arrested you know, before he, was, he, he would make it to Rome. But like Paul, you know, I hope that we'll be able to say right, at the end of our lives that we have fought a good fight, right, that we have finished the race, we have kept the faith. Right? Yes, we're going to make plans, but right? remember that it's the Lord that establishes our steps. Now, the last request that Paul makes as we finish up here. Uh, <clears throat> this is the very last appeal that Paul makes to the Roman church, right? So he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed by your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And so lastly, I think what Paul asks for here is prayer. Right? If you read the book of Acts, you know that you know, a lot of the you know, Jewish people were really angry at what Paul was doing, and they tried to arrest him, you know, tried to throw him into prison, which he was multiple times. Right? He was also really nervous about going back to Jerusalem. Right? Are they going to accept him as an apostle? Are they going to accept this big collection that he's been doing? Right? So he's praying for them, but what's really uh, what Paul's asking for is not just any prayer. Right? But he says, strive together with me. And that word strive, I think, can also be translated like agonize together in prayer with me. Right? He's begging, he's asking the people in Rome, the church in Rome, pray for me and pray for the work of my ministry. Right? And not all of us here are going to be called to go. Right? All, not all of us here is God going to say, hey, I'm going to put on your heart to preach Christ where he's never been preached before. Now, I actually do believe, right? I, be, I do believe actually in Christ and maybe in this room, right, God is calling some of you to go where Christ has never been preached before. But many of us, maybe, we're not called to go, but God does call each one of us to pray. And uh, William Carey, uh, the great missionary, uh, before he left for India, um, he said to his friend, he said, I will go down into the pit, but you have to hold the rope. Right? I will go down into the pit, but you have to hold the rope. And what he meant by the rope was prayer. Right? And so he said, you may not be called to go, right? God has called me to go, but we support, we hold on to the rope, you know, through prayer. And so each one, you know, so each one of our missionaries, you know, if you've never seen our mission board out there, right, it's God's calling us, I think, to strive together, you know, because the work of the ministry is hard, right? But to strive together in prayer for God's word, right, for their ministry to reach the ends of the earth. Right, so next week, we are going to finish up our study in Romans. Uh, but my prayer for, for each one of you now is that don't let any, everything that I said here just be a good reminder for you, but let us really apply these into our lives as disciples of Christ. Let's pray together.
God, we thank you for uh, your word that continually speaks truth into our lives. Um, but Father, we also know that uh, the truth that we hear in your word takes uh, oftentimes a very difficult journey uh, into our hearts. <coughs> Father, we know that um, even the gospel that, that you have um, so clearly laid out for us in scripture, uh, sometimes we still speak words of uh, untruth to our own lives. We still speak tr- words that are saying that I am unworthy, or we still speak you know, false things like I am not uh, lovable or I'm not acceptable before you. So Father, we pray that all the truth of Scripture would come into our hearts, that we'd be able to stand, know that we are in good standing before you, that we're able to come to you, uh, to your throne of grace. And, and, and even right now as we pray to you, that we are before you and we are loved and accepted by you, not because of what we have done, but because what Christ has done for us. But let, but let this righteousness that is in us not remain dormant either, but let us be able to live it out um, in, in all the areas of life. So Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here. I pray for, our, uh, for the way that we're thinking about our lives. Uh, help us to think of our lives first and foremost as your child, but also as your disciple. And give us a willingness to learn. Give us a willingness to be able to be molded and shaped by you as we do all things for, for, for your glory. And so we pray this all in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. If you're able, will you please rise to sing a song of response?